In Nahum chapter number 1, we'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. The world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. And the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we bless your holy name. We are thankful, Lord, that you're the God of the Bible. Lord, you're not the God of a lot of these TV preachers and a lot of these uh, politicians and a lot of these uh, uh, naysayers that, Lord, want to drag you out at election time or drag you out and, and uh, Lord, uh, uh, portray you as something you are not. We're glad that you gave us the Word of God, the absolute and final authority for our lives. And God, we're glad that through in... Uh, uh, the Word of God, we see uh, all about you, that you're the omnipotent God, and you're the omniscient God, and you're the omnipresent God. Uh, God, uh, I'm glad you're my God. And God, I'm glad for that day, as those preachers were talking about when they got born again. I'm glad for that day, 1974, when you came to where I was, and God saved my never-dying soul. Uh, God, I'm not worthy to even call upon your name, uh, God, I'm glad I've been robed in your righteousness, been justified by faith. Uh, God, I'm glad that I've been saved by the good grace of God, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, now, Father, as we come to you tonight, we realize that, Lord, your imminent return is soon coming. God, we know that before you come literally, we know that the church will be taken out of here. Lord, we know that time is fleeting away, and God, if we're going to do anything for God, we need to do it now. But Lord, we also realize in John 15, you said, without you, we can do nothing. So Father, we ask for your touch and your help. God, we pray for these missionaries, that God, you would certainly raise their support, get them to the field, and give them souls for their labor. And God, we realize that Lord, Florence, Kentucky, and Lord, Idaho, and uh, Portland, and Seattle, and all across this globe, there's people dying and going to hell. And God, we know it's your will that none of them should perish. And God, uh, help us, Lord, uh, uh, to realize that, God, we've fallen way behind on what we should be doing as uh, uh, believers. And God, I pray that, God, we'd shine his lights. Uh, and God, we'd win souls in this day and age. You said, He's, whosoever wins souls is wise. Uh, and God, I pray you'd give us a burden. Now, God, I pray you'd help us tonight. And Lord, we thank you for the good singing. We thank you for these missionary brethren. And God, we thank you for this dear pastor. And God, our folks that have come out tonight. Now, Lord, I pray for Brother Donald's friend. Uh, Lord, he told me for service, Lord, his... Uh, uh, father passed away last night. And God, I pray for his friend. His Lord, as far as we know, his friend's lost. Uh, and God, I pray that you'd use this to work in his heart. We'd see him born again. And God, I pray for Seth. He's hurt his hand. And I pray for him. He's at the hospital now. You'd be with him. And God, uh, touch him. God, there's others that are sick. There's some that are traveling. And God, there's some who are providentially hindered. Be with them. But Father, those of us that are here tonight, those that are watching via live stream, God, I certainly pray you'd send revival in these days. Uh, and God, you'd get glory to your glorious name. Use this unworthy vessel now. And Father, we'll thank you for what you do, for it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to draw your attention to several things from these verses. But before I do, I want you to understand what Nahum's all about. 
70 years prior to this, Jonah reluctantly went and preached to Nineveh. Now, you know the story of Jonah. You was taught that in Sunday school, uh, how God called him, told him to go preach to Nineveh. He said, okay, Lord. And he goes and he charters a boat uh, going to Tarshish. And if you looked in the maps in the back of your Bible, you see Tarshish uh, is the opposite direction of Nineveh. It amazes me how uh, uh, week in and week out we come to church, God will preach a message, uh, we'll shake our heads, we'll say amen. When we get to the parking lot, we do exactly the opposite of what God just told us to do. And we find on that ship, God troubled the waters, and you know that uh, Jonah realized uh, he brought all that uh, harm upon them men. They threw him off in the sea, uh, and uh, God prepared a fish. Uh, that uh, came and swallowed up Jonah. And there's a lot of Bible correctors. A lot of folks have real problems if you say it's a whale uh, or a fish. Uh, all I'm going to tell you is uh, uh, something big enough, if it's a catfish or a carp or a bluegill, if it's big enough uh, uh, to swallow a man whole and then he lives in there and feels like he's in hell uh, uh, for three days and three nights, it's a big old fish, all right? But while he's there, can you imagine all the acid in the belly of that fish? Have you ever seen what they pull out some of them big fish? License plates and all kinds of... He's down there. He thought he was in hell. But while he repented in the belly of that fish, that fish puked him out. Yes, I said puke. You're welcome, Lucas. I heard you liked my vomit comment the other day. So there you go, bro. That was for you. He hit the ground running and he went and preached to Nineveh. Now, Brother Kevin, his desire was, because God uh, sent a message, either they repent and give him about 30 days, uh, or I'm going to destroy you. Well, Jonah was looking for destruction. Yeah. Kind of like a lot of you Republicans looking at the Democratic Party tonight. You're praying God uh, destroys your enemies. I know what you're doing, huh? But Jonah goes and preaches, uh, and uh, uh, those in Nineveh took him serious. Matter of fact, they fasted, even made the animals fast, and great revival came to Nineveh. One of the greatest revivals recorded in the Scriptures. Now, 70 years later, they've fallen back into their idolatrous and pernicious ways, and God, in His long-suffering, once again raises up a prophet. And Nahum comes and preaches to Nineveh. Now, notice a few things. I want you to notice, first of all, an aspect of God that is seldom mentioned. Now, if you watch Joel, or you watch uh, uh, Joyce, or you watch TBN, or you watch any of that other junk, all you're ever going to hear is about the love of God, how God loves everybody. God loves you just the way you are, and just come as you are, and you can stay as you are. Well, that's not what the Bible preaches. Now, God is love, and God does love you more than you even know what love is. And God does love you, but He hates your sin. And God bids you to come to Him. But if you'd really come to Him, uh, uh, my dear friends, His love's so strong enough, it'll change you from the inside out. Uh, for if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. I wouldn't give you a nickel for a doctrine, and I wouldn't give you a nickel for a God that couldn't save you and change you. But I'm here to tell you, if you get blood washed and born again, it'll change you from the inside out. But we find in this text, yes, God is love. But we find another aspect of God. Look at verse number 2. God is jealous. You don't hear that preached on much. You see, my dear friends, uh, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth uh, uh, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost uh, and that you've been bought with a price. Uh, uh, we know the price was the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know that you was on the oxen block of sin. Uh, 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 my dear friends, sin owned you. Uh, uh, sin had you bound uh, and the devil had the other end of the chain uh, and people uh, couldn't pay your sin debt. Uh, you couldn't pay your sin debt. Uh, and when it looked 
look like you's going down for the last time. Uh, there was a voice that spoke up uh, and said, I'll pay your price. Uh, and the Lord Jesus, uh, through his shed blood uh, and through the finished works of Calvary, uh, bought you off the auction block of sin. Uh, hey, uh, if the Son has set you free, you're free indeed. Uh, you're no longer a chain to your sin. Uh, he broke the chains. Uh, he changed your life. Uh, hey, he loved you uh, and done for you what no one else could do for you. Uh, but he did not save you so that you could live however you want to. You've been bought with a price. Yes, it was free to you, but it cost God everything. And my dear friends, God does not appreciate nor tolerate sin in the life of those He's redeemed. He is a jealous God. Mm, my dear friends, it's our sins and our iniquities that separates us from God. Mm, we want to lump them all together. Now sin is the transgression of the law. The Bible says for him to know to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. But iniquity is unequal dealing with God. It's whenever we put something in front of God in our life. And when we do that, we make that our God. And that is exactly what Nineveh is guilty of. We become idolatrous when we put anything before God. And let me just help you something. God is jealous. Hmm. Now, I've done, done told you. If I come home and tell Miss Annette I've been pretty faithful, she's not going to like that too much. And she's really not going to like it when I say, Well, baby, I love you, but I'd rather spend time with someone else. Hmm? You say, what will happen? Well, when I showed up at the house, my bags would be, and, and everything I'd own would be on the front lawn. You know what I'm saying? Huh? And rightfully so. Well, if we won't tolerate that from our spouses, do you realize we are a spouse to Jesus? Should he tolerate that in our lives? Where's that good spirit I had a minute ago? Huh? I ain't even preaching. Y'all bogging down on me, huh? We see an aspect that is seldom mentioned of God. He's a jealous God. Notice the anger of God in verse number 2. Now, I'm going somewhere. Hang with me. And the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Can I say the Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day? Can I say the Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God? The Bible says, for our God is a consuming fire. Again, I don't listen to Joel, but if I did, I promise you he's not going to say anything like that. You don't sell seats at $10 a head and sell books and you'll know, put in 20,000 people in an auditorium. Tell them they're all going to fry like a bunch of crispy critters, huh? Uh, but I want to tell you something. God is angry. He reserveth wrath for his adversaries. Does he not say in the scriptures that uh, we're either for him or against him? When we were sinners, we were at enmity with him. But did he not tell Peter, one of his chosen when Peter stood in opposition to him, did he not call him Satan? Did he not say, get thee behind me, Satan? So we're either following or we're hindering. And God does not appreciate when we want to dictate to him how we will live. We see his anger. We see his jealousy. Notice the actions of God in verse number 3. The Lord is slow to anger. Thanks be unto God. Well, get on our face right now. Say, hallelujah, thanks be unto God. He's slow to anger, great in power, will not at all quit the wicked. That means they're not getting away with it. You mark her down. Huh? Nancy Pelosi thinks she's pulling a fast one. She's not getting away with it. Hmm? Huh? That sorry, no good Judge Roberts on the Supreme Court. He's not getting away with it. Huh? When he's holding casinos up higher than churches, he's going to pay for it. You know he's going to, he's going to stand before God. He's not going to be the judge then. You do know that, don't you? No? Well, I'm glad you got back on board. All right? 
The Bible says the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind, in the storm. The clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, maketh it dry. He dries up all the rivers, goes through there, dries up uh, uh, the flowers, and mountains quake at, at him. Verse 5, the hills melt, the earth burned at his presence. Uh, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Uh, 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 the Bible says, verse 6, Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks thrown down by him. Can I say, uh, who is likened unto our God? Hmm. He controls time and space and all the elements. There's no one like our God. But then notice the advantages of knowing God. Hmm. Verse number 7, you ought to underscore it if you don't have it underscored. The Lord is good. Hallelujah. You heard some of that tonight. He's a good God. Huh? He's never done anything wrong to me. Can I say that? He is a good God. The psalmist said he's great and greatly to be praised. Uh, he's a good God. He goes on to say he's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And Brother James sang on that. Uh, says he knoweth them that trust in him. Aren't you glad he knows you by name? Uh, hey, he knew all about you before you got saved, but now he knows you. You have a relationship with him. Uh, hey, you have fellowship with him. You have communion with him. I've got good news. Uh, some of us are getting old, uh, and we don't remember like we once did. Uh, and there's a terrible disease uh, out there called Alzheimer's. Uh, I've got good news. Even if you forget the day you got saved, uh, even if you forget God, uh, he'll never forget you uh, I'm glad I'm engraved in the palm of his hand uh, my name's written down in the Lamb's book of life uh, hey hallelujah I'm glad I'm one of his uh, can I say he's our stronghold he's my rock and the waves of diversity come they can't overthrow him uh, he's my refuge I find a, a, a strength and I find a, a, a refuge from the heat of the day under the shadow of his wings uh, and can I say he is the remedy for everything I'll face uh, but I'm not going to preach on any of that and I'm interested in verse number 3 the Bible says the Lord is slow to anger great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind. Now I want to preach for just a few minutes on his way in the whirlwind. Now we know that a whirlwind is the biblical term for what we call a tornado. Well, I did a little research on some tornadoes. Found out some interesting things about them. Can I say, first of all, tornadoes connect the heavens and the earth. And can I say that God will send a wind our way from the glory world to connect with us. Hmm? I'm thankful that He has a way, Brother Phil, to get our attention. Not only do tornadoes connect the heavens and the earth, uh, I find that tornadoes, Brother Bob, have contrasting winds. Mm, they say that one wind goes counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, and the other wind goes clockwise in the southern hemisphere. Can I say that many times me and God's not on the same page? He's a going one direction, uh, and in my flesh, I'm wanting to go another direction. Uh, and can I say that'll cause a conflict? Uh, it's always better when I'm on the same page with God. Uh, it's always better when we're headed in the same direction. Uh, it's always better when I let Him lead uh, and I just follow. Uh, can I say something else about tornadoes? Uh, they're a condescending funnel. Now, get a hold of this, Brother Phil. Because you even made men when I was mean. Now, you've seen pictures of tornadoes. They never look like that when you see a real one, but they, they, they're like a big funnel. They're like a cone. It's amazing that God, with his throne in the sides of the north, has all of heaven 
and he funnels it all the way through time and space, through every galaxy, through every star constellation, through every planet, through everything that there is to get all the way to Earth and get all the way to where you are in that weld shop there at Mazak, and he funnels it right down to you so you can have everything you need from God. Isn't that amazing? Huh? Sure it is. Huh? Now, can I help you with something, Brother Donald? We don't funnel things to God. He funnels heaven to us. He knows where we are. He knows what we need. Uh, and He knows how to uh, uh, transpire and move and direct uh, and get everything we need right to our heart. Isn't that amazing? Sure. Mm -hmm. Now, I can say this about tornadoes. They're really bad in the Midwest where there's no mountains or hills. But when a tornado hits, it may do a lot of d destruction for a lot of miles, but it doesn't hit everywhere at the same time. Isn't it amazing? When you're going through something, God knows how to do something in your life, and it may not affect anybody else around you. I've seen where a tornado will tear up a, a house on one side of the road, not even touch anything on the other side. Isn't it amazing how God knew, knows exactly what you need? Uh, he knows how to single you out. He knows how to find you and help you and funnel to you what you need. Isn't that amazing? Mm -mm. Let me say something else about tornadoes. I found out that they create turbulence. Mm. Nobody says, uh, let's have a nice little breezy tornado today. They create turbulence. That's because they are brought about by two different temperatures. There's a warm front and a cold front that meets, and you get a tornado. And can I say, the things of God are always warm. He always kindles a fire in my soul. But can I say, there are times when we get cold. Hmm? And when you're cold and indifferent on God, preaching it and sweet to your soul. When you're cold and indifferent on God, singing doesn't bless you. When you're cold and indifferent on God, you drag into church instead of running to church. Uh, and uh, my dear friends, if you stay that way, there's some turbulence coming your way. huh? And I thought about this. Uh, Job said in Job 37, verse 9, Out of the south cometh the whirlwind, and cold out of the north. And that's what happens. We're not on the same page and not at the same temperature with God. But let me say this also about tornadoes. Tornadoes have um, catastrophic uh, results if you're not prepared. Hmm? Y'all remember the Wizard of Oz? When they didn't get down in the cellar, Dorothy and Toto ended up with the old wicked witch on the bicycle flying around in the tornado. Uh, what do they always tell you to do? Get to a low place. Get to a place where there aren't any windows around and be prepared if the tornado comes. But if you're not prepared, my dear friends, catastrophe is coming your way. You know what's headed for America? Catastrophe. America's not ready for Jesus to come. America wasn't ready for Donald Trump. You think they're ready for Jesus? Hmm? Oh. Listen to what the Bible says. In Proverbs 127, the Bible says, When your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Isaiah 40 and 23 says, That bringeth the princes to nothing, he maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. Uh, and he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. Isaiah 66 and 15 says this, uh, For behold, the Lord will come with fire, uh, and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury, and... Uh, his rebuke with flames of fire. Now, I got to thinking about all that. God has his way in the whirlwind. Let me give you some ways God uses whirlwinds in our lives. We'll go to the house. Can I say, first of all, God uses whirlwinds to send conviction. I've been told the unchurched crowd... Don't start thinking about church unless something 
tragic has happened in their lives. A divorce, a death, uh, somebody get real sick, a pandemic. God uses whirlwinds to bring convictions in the life of His children when they are no longer uh, seeking His face, when they are not uh, 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 reading the Scriptures uh, with intent, uh, when they are not praying uh, in the Spirit, uh, when they are just going through the motions, when they get cold, uh, uh, when they get uh, uh, to where their lips they honor God, but their heart is far from God, uh, uh, God will send something in their life to wake them up, to convict them and let them know where they are, huh? It's a dangerous thing. We've had four revival meetings this summer. And yet there are some I've yet to see broken. There's some I've yet to see in the altar begging God for His will for their life. And I'm going to tell you where you are. You read your Bible, you don't get a thing out of it. When you pray, your prayers aren't hitting the ceiling. Because you're just going through the motions. You're trying to coast in your Christianity. It don't work. You're either on fire or you're getting cold. There are no middle ground with God. Everything's black or white. There's no gray area. And some of you have tried to endure this summer. Now, there's all kinds of reasons for why you are where you are. Uh, life gets hard. Sometimes in the hardness and harshness of life, You've taken your eyes off of God. You've started looking around. You're struggling. Find two nickels to rub together. and Then you look around and you see somebody's being really blessed. Uh, you're working and working and working. Then you're seeing folks sitting around drawing a check, not working. You're having to do everything you can to provide for your family. It looks like other people don't have to struggle with that. And all that weighs on your mind because you're looking around. Why do you think the writer of Hebrews told us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? The devil wants you to get to looking around. See, when you get to looking around, you have pity parties. You know what you really, if you're going to look around, what you need to look around is find people who is not as blessed and fortunate as you are. That will cause you to be thankful for where you are, huh? But so many people get to looking around, and then all of a sudden, deep down inside, you start blaming God. Oh, you never say it with your mouth, but you start blaming God. And you come to church, and you get cold sitting on a church pew. You get bitter sitting on a church pew. We've had some of the greatest preaching come through here this summer, and you have sit there, and it bounces off you like a rubber ball on a brick wall. You know why? Because you're not right with God. That's the danger. You better get before God and ask Him to break your heart and get right with God because there just might be a tornado coming your way. Brother Bob, God's long-suffering. And he, he gives us preaching and gives us preaching and gives us preaching. The Holy Ghost starts to deal and tries to work, tries to work. But you'll say, God to no, you say no to God one last time. And God knows how to get your attention. He knows how to break you, Brother Eddie. He knows, Miss Marcy, that thing that's closest to your heartstring. Hey, you remember what he asked of Abraham? He asked for Isaac, didn't he? Can I say something? If you're not in fellowship with God, he may not ask. He may take Isaac. It's a dangerous, dangerous thing. God uses whirlwinds to bring conviction. Can I say this? God uses whirlwinds to bring conversions. Thanks be unto God, people got saved because they got shook up. Hmm? Huh? What a blessing. Folks realize, hey, I'm not ready to meet the Lord. And they got saved. What a blessing. Well, y'all done quit on me. I didn't realize everybody here hadn't done business in revival. So, you know. One of my favorite preaching stories is from a fellow early 1920s by the name of Cyclone Mac McKenzie. Any of you preachers here, Cyclone Mac? Cyclone Mac McKenzie got the name. And this isn't in my notes. It just came to me, and I just realized I'm preaching on cyclones. 
He got the name because he's preaching an old tent revival. And they're out in an open field. And while they're having service, a tornado starts coming toward the tent. Cyclone Mac goes out in the field between the tent and the tornado, gets on his face, begins to call on God, and that tornado stopped and turned and went another direction. That's where he got the name, Cyclone Mac. Amen. Cyclone Mac was preaching in that same meeting. Now, I mean, that, that thought of praying a tornado going somewhere, that's far beyond this guy. You know, I'm thinking, Lord, have mercy. I'm just praying for my daily bread. I can't pray for a tornado to... But the next part of Cyclone Mac I identify real, with real good, okay? So I got to tell the rest of the story. There was a lady attending the services. Her husband was the town drunk. Her husband told her if she came back to tent revival that he was going to beat the snot out of her. And true to his words, when she come home from revival meeting, he did. He beat the snot out of her. Well, praise be unto God, she had enough God in her. She just kept coming. She come in that next night. She's got black eyes. Everybody, everybody knew what happened. You know, they were kind. They didn't go up and they didn't badger about it. She come in. She's ashamed. She sits down. Cyclone Max of preaching. The husband comes in the tent and is going to drag her out by the hair of her head. Cyclone Mac, the guy who turns tornadoes, turned tornado on the husband. He grabbed a fellow, beat the snot out of him, threw him down in a pew. The guy sobered up and got born again that night. What a blessing! I can't find Bible for that, but I sure do like that kind of guy. You say, why, why am I only hearing about Cyclone Mac now? Because there was only one Cyclone Mac. Today you get thrown in jail for that stuff and you start a jail ministry. That's what happens, huh? Can I say, God uses tornadoes, problems, for folks to see their lost condition in need of a Savior. And through whirlwinds, there's conversions. Can I say this? God uses whirlwinds to send chastening. The Bible says that if you're without chastisement, you're a bastard, not a son. Again, Joel Osteen's never going to preach that. I don't know why I'm on Joel tonight. I know you all don't watch Joel. But he's not going to preach on the chastening hand of the Lord. The Bible makes it clear in Hebrews chapter 12 that if we as fathers know how to give gifts to our children, how much more our father and also uh, 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 if we know how to chasten our children, God knows how to chasten you. Now nobody likes the chastening rod of God. But can I say this? I'm thankful that he's chastened me from time to time because I know who is the one in authority. Hmm? Listen, since I made you mad, I might as well make you good mad. The worst thing as a parent you could ever do is never chasing your children. Because that means you don't love them. Hmm? Listen, sometimes they're going to get out of line. There's a right way to chase them. Now hear me. The proper way to chasten your children is, first of all, sit down and explain to them why they're getting ready to get chastened. You never want to chasten your children in anger. Sit down and tell them why they are getting in trouble. And then you have to chasten them to break their will. Now, we had three foster kids. All of them are different. Each one of them, breaking their will was different. I've yet to figure out how to break Sydney, so I just let Mama handle her. (laughs) You have to break their will. Chastening is not abusing your children. Sometimes you can break their will by just telling them you're disappointed in them. Sometimes you've got to beat the devil out of them and God give them a nice little spot on the backside where that can happen. But you are to chasten your children. Can I say this? God never chastens his children that they don't know they need chastened. I've heard people say, well, I don't know why these things are happening to me. 
Well, are you reading the Bible? Amen. The Bible tells you, you know, how to walk, how to talk, how to spit, how to, you know, do all that stuff, huh? Sure. You're not to have any corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. You're to walk in newness of life. You're to shine as lights. You're to embrace the, uh, the scriptures and... You live right, and if you don't, you don't, you don't, and the preacher keeps preaching on it, preaching on it, preaching on it, and you don't, you don't, you don't, God's going to chasten you. Now, if you don't know that, then either you're, you're very ignorant, or you're just not listening. And can I help you something? Sometimes children get disciplined because they're not listening. All right, I'll move off of that. I've seen two, two, two folks pass out during that one. But can I say this? God also uses whirlwinds to send condemnation, judgment. I'm going to tell you something. America's headed for a fall because America's aborted over 50 million babies and sanctioned it. Now listen, I'm not supposed to tell you who to vote for, but I'll tell you this. It's very clear. One side aborts babies, one side don't. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know anything else. So I don't like personality. I don't like any of them. But I'm not going to sanction baby murders. That's all you need to know. Mm -mm. God told Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. When is it a baby? The second it's conceived. It's not real tough. Can I say, you know, a lot of these storms that have hit America is the chastening hand of God. Why they keep rebuilding New Orleans, I have no idea. You'd think they'd get it sooner or later. There's a bunch of you know, voodoo demon worshipers down there, and God keeps wiping it off the mat, and they keep rebuilding it. And by the way, they're using our tax dollars to do it. Sometimes God sends condemnation. God just revealed, and, it's, and it's, it's amazing. If you say, well, that's God's judgment on America, oh, man, that liberal crowd will have a field day because they listen to Joel, and God's got to love. So God would never do that. Huh? Well, let me give you a couple other things. God also sends a whirlwind for confirmation. God sends revival through a tempest. Huh? Did not the early church there, that 120 in the upper room, when the comforter came, did it not say he came as a mighty rushing wind? Yes. Sounds like a tornado to me. Huh? Huh? We pray for a breeze from heaven. You know what's going to straighten out America? When God's churches get a tempest from heaven. Are you listening? I'm talking about uh, a, a sin-killing Holy Ghost revival, uh, and it'll come... Uh, like a whirlwind as far as our churches know it. Hmm? Amen. You know, true revival hasn't come to America in over 100 years. We're not going to get a little passive three-day meeting and have revival. That's why God's given us four. He's working a little more bark off each time. Hmm? Because uh, we didn't get here overnight, and we're not going to have revival overnight. Uh, too many people have incorporated everything but God in their lives, and God has to strip us layer by layer to get us where we're ready for what he really wants to do. And then I thought about this. God also uses whirlwinds to send comfort. Have you ever been so burdened down and then peace come like a flood? Just a wave where you don't even have the words to describe how your soul feels. But you're just glad that the master took notice of you and a flood came upon you, and then you don't have to worry about anything else because you do know he's on the throne and that he's taking notice of you. Uh, thank God for whirlwinds. i pin this down. Whirlwinds from God are either a tempest or his touch. Both are designed to draw one to him. Now, said all that, say this. God's a jealous God. And God's a good God. How's he looking at you tonight? I don't want a tempest to come to straighten me out. 
I may need a tempest to help me get out of bed tomorrow because of all the adversity coming against me. But I don't want a tempest to put me in the bed tomorrow because I'm ignoring him. I want to be behind the jealous God. And I want to be a recipient of the good God. I wonder tonight, how's he looking at you? Where do you stand with him? I said, preacher, I've been in church more this summer than, than I can recall. Wonderful. But how much church has gotten in you? Where are you at with God? Because yes, he's long-suffering, but there comes a time when his patience is worn out. You know how these parents tell their kids, one, two, three, and then they never do anything? Well, you might be on three or about ready to hit three, and God does something. I got out and read again uh, J. Harold Smith's God's Three Deadlines this week. You know, that message couldn't be preached today. Lord, have mercy. I, got in, I forgot how unpolitically correct he was. It was just preached in 75. But man, how America has drifted. But see, there comes a point where you're caught across God's deadline, and that's it. I wonder tonight, is a storm of brewing headed your way? You know, up here on this little knoll, I can sit in my office, and all of a sudden it seems like the trees start shifting in a different direction. I know storms are coming. How are the trees outside of your life's doing? Is everything calm and still? Or is there a storm of brewing? Friend, serving God is serious business. Living for God is serious business. Because there's a real hell and people are dying and going there. And the only thing that is keeping them from that is what you and I do for Jesus. So I wonder, is he jealous towards you? Or is he good to you? Tonight I wouldn't live. I wouldn't leave here with having, without having the goodness of God in my life. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation while he's getting a song picked out. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Lord, I know you'd be just and send us all kinds of judgment our way, but I'm glad for your mercy. I'm glad for your grace. I'm glad you have your way in the whirlwind. God, I believe it's going to take a whirlwind to wake America up. Lord, it's going to take a whirlwind to wake some of your churches up. God, I pray if there's anyone here tonight that needs woke up, that, Lord, tonight they take to heart the seriousness of the message. Yes, you're a stronghold in a day of trouble, but only for those that are on your good side. For those that aren't serving you and aren't being faithful, Lord, they'll be caught up in the tempest. So, God, I pray, if there's anybody like that tonight, they'd get right with God. They'd open up their heart. They'd surrender. One preacher talked about at the age of 12, submitting his life, surrendering his life. There's some of your people been saved a long time and have never really just surrendered their life to the will of God. Maybe somebody like that tonight. God, I pray they come. Lord, maybe there's somebody here tonight. Lord, they've been on the fence, straddling it. Lord, it's time they get on the Lord's side and just serve you faithfully. And then, God, maybe there's somebody here tonight lost without God. I pray you'd convict them. And through cords of love, draw them to repentance. God, I pray you'd have your way in this invitation now. Speak to hearts. Get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.